This episode of John Joe Lions Reviews is sponsored by Last Shirt on the Left. To see the fully uncut version of this video, head over to patreon.com forward slash John Joe Lions. What's the What's going on? My name is John Joe Lyons, and today I'm here to present to you my review for Sensor. Written by Prano Bailey, Bond, and Anthony Fletcher, and directed by Bond, Sensor stars. All of these stuff. After viewing a strangely familiar video nasty, Enid, a film censor, sets out to solve the past mystery of her sister's disappearance, embarking on a quest that dissolves the line between fiction and reality. Hello everybody and welcome to what promises to be a very interesting year. If you follow me on Instagram or have seen the last couple of videos, you'll know that I'm currently in pre-production on my short film Better Anything. And between meetings and panic attacks, I've been inspired to take a look at some of my favourite British indie horror movies. While rocking back and forth, quietly whispering to myself, if I can do this, everything's gonna be fine and this is gonna be nothing like your failed rap career. And the first one we're gonna be taking a look at is Sensor. Released in 2021, I remember this film getting a lot of good press and given the setting, time period and aesthetic, I knew this was gonna be a hit for me. There's also the subject matter and the occupation of the main character. The moral panic of video nasties in the UK in the 80s is a certain chapter of history that really pisses me off. I was born in 88, so I wasn't around when all of this kicked off, but I do remember the effects of this time period lasting well into the 90s. I also remember my mum finding a VHS of zombie flesh eaters under the stairs but not letting me watch it, sparking an obsession. I told my dad about this discovery and he went on to explain in great detail the scene when the woman gets that giant bit of wood stuck in her eye. Over Sunday lunch I think. Also, mum, I was old enough to strangle but not old enough to watch the film. Where's the logic in that? Anyway, the whole video nasty era, the arrests and the moral panic stirred up by the British government and Mary Whitehouse, a woman who is the literal human personification of the phrase you must be fun at parties, is a bit of a sore spot for me. So when I found out there was a horror movie using this time period as the setting, it got my attention. And then there's this quote from the director that I found on IMDb. Don't come for me, H-bomber guy. I was reading an article about Hammer Horror, the British studio that made the likes of Dracula, The Mummy, and Curse of the Wolfman, which looked at how film censors worked in that period. It made me think, if violent images are meant to make us lose control, what prevents the censor from doing that? It was that hypocrisy of thinking, I can watch this, but if you watch it, you're gonna go out and shoot someone. And let me just say right off the bat, what a cool idea. I've always seen the censor as the antagonist of the horror fan. You imagine they see themselves as the savior, the hero of their story, but in reality, they're the villain whose mission is to destroy art or at the very least mutilate it until it fits their own twisted version of what is acceptable. I mean look what those bags did to Friday the 13th part 7 the new blood. There's a side by side comparison on YouTube where you could see what was originally intended and it is shocking. They took what is in my opinion a thoroughly entertaining slasher movie with great kills and made it basically bloodless. Why? I know another group of people who wanted to mutilate perfection in order to achieve some twisted version of paradise. Yeah, the people who manually review YouTube videos. It's censored, Greg. Please don't deny me all $7 of my revenue. To flip it and make the censor a victim is great, and I do wonder if this is something that came up at the time. Was this a genuine worry? Because when I read that quote from the director, I was like, oh yeah. Who watches The Watchmen? Censors are horror cops. Trust me when I say I think you're gonna love this one. But before we get into all of that, I just want to remind you, you can see this video completely uncut and early at patreon.com forward slash John Joe Lyons for as little as $2 a month. That's it. If you want to see the videos uncut and get access to the Discord, go over there. And let's not forget all of the recent casualties from the channel. There's like six or seven full reviews that are only available on the Patreon. Some because of copyright reasons and others because I upset the director. And if you don't have $2 but still like the content, please click subscribe. 
It's free, it really helps, and I really appreciate it. We're 900 subscribers from 20k, and I can't quite believe it. And as you can see, we now have official John Joe Lyons merch. We did before on Teespring, but I'm not really happy with the quality of that stuff. No, this time it's been produced by the official sponsor of the channel, Last Shirt on the left. And if you click the link in the description and pin comment, you can go and grab yourself one now. And massive shouts out specifically to Greg Parsons, who did the design. He sent it to me randomly, and I don't think he quite anticipated how excited I would get. But anyway, it's there available on the website now, so get it before we sell out. But anyway, I'm in the mood to take another journey into madness, so let's not waste any more time. Get ready to wonder if they were right about everything the entire time. This is Sensor. The movie begins with this woman in the woods lit up in my most favourite way. Can't go wrong with a cheeky bit of giallo lighting. She takes off running but quickly stacks it and screams as she's dragged away. Hang on. Here we meet our hero Enid, played by Neve Algar, as she sits with her colleague Sanderson, played by Nathan Barley. After the screening, Enid looks over her nose. She discusses making further cuts to the film, specifically the eye gouging, as she says it's too real. They go back and forth for a bit when Enid lists off the damage. I've salvaged the tug of war with the intestines. I've kept in most of the screwdriver stuff. And I've only trimmed the tiniest bit of the end of the genitals. I really love his face in that shot. Enid then makes it clear how passionate she is about getting this right. We can't afford to make mistakes. I'm cutting it. Cut to Enid putting in a new tape as audio from news reports talk about video nasties while the TV plays images from various horror movies. The only one I recognised here was Driller Killer, a film that I've weirdly never seen. I heard it's not that great and only got banned at the time because of the cover art, much like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Still, I should probably check it out as soon as possible. Cut to the title card, then to the censors having a nice chilled out chat. No one's gonna pick this up and think it's a documentary, it's so fake. For you, it might be sausages for intestines, but what if it gets into the hands of children? Exactly. Kids. After a tasty bit of dissatisfaction with the UK government's priorities at the time, each member casts their vote on whether to pass or reject the film. Reject. I agree. Few cuts. I'd pass it. Cut to Enid and Anne having just finished another screening. Anne asks Enid if she'll type up her notes for her as she's missing her sister's party and buggers off leaving our hero to get on with the work. Cut to Enid working, locking up and walking home. While walking through this tunnel, Enid spots someone she thinks she recognises but when she catches up to them it's just a stranger. She apologises and the person walks away with Enid having to walk in the same direction. Like if that happened to you in that tunnel then as you're walking away you turn around and see the person still following you, I'd just break out into a run. Cut to news footage of the miners strike then to old Maggie Thatch talking b at the table Enid is getting stuck into a crossword and having the best time. The phone rings but she doesn't answer instead letting the machine get her. It's her mum who tells Enid her father has booked them a table for dinner. This is a death certificate. Weird choice for a starter, but fair play. It seems that many years ago, Enid's little sister Nina disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Enid has always had hope that they'd find her, but this document makes it clear her parents do not share the same faith. Enid still won't accept that Nina's gone, even with her parents practically begging her to move on. We're not blaming you. Mum and I are only trying to do what's best, love. It's the right decision for all of us, Enid. Enid finally smiles and pretends to go along with it as normal dinner conversation resumes. So how's work, Enid? Seen anything you'd recommend? It's not entertainment, Mum. I do it to protect people. Yeah, protecting people from fun. Listen, if I want to see a fictional baby's face get eaten directly off its head, I should be allowed to do so. I hear the face is the best part. Cut to Enid arriving home and taking a long hard look at that death certificate. She then looks through her sister box before putting it all away. On the train, Enid watches a couple argue, then spots a headline about how video nasties are destroying the world, pretty much. Back at work, Enid and Anne get ready to watch the next film. And Enid asks what they're watching, suggesting this is a brand new film they've sat down to assess. Now, if this is indeed a movie they're starting from the beginning, can someone please explain to me why it starts like this? <laughs> Good lord. Post screening, the pair discuss what they just watched with Enid appearing unshaken. She once again refers to the importance of getting it right when Sanderson says their boss Frasier wants to see them. And it's bad news. A man that was arrested in Brighouse yesterday, he uh, killed his wife, then he 
And you tore off an eight her face. That's a rough date night. Went on to shoot his two children. Jesus Christ, man, the dinner conversation couldn't have been that bad. But why does this terrible tragedy concern Enid? Well, there's a movie called Deranged, a movie Enid and Sanderson passed featuring a killer committing these exact same acts. Somehow the press know it was them that passed the film and are now blaming them for the deaths, which is a hard situation if you ask me. This news disturbs Enid and we get a quick flash of the past when she comes back to reality. Frasier continues to moan when we cut to Enid at home as a news report about the murders plays on the TV. The phone rings again but this time Enid decides to answer. Mum? Despicable woman. Letting people see that disgusting film, you should be ashamed of yourself. It's alright mate, I get calls like that all the time. I'm just happy with the human interaction if I'm honest. The phone rings again and we see a young Enid as her father asks her where her sister is. Enid, where is she? Enid! On the train, Enid sees this concerning headline and then she's ambushed by the press outside work. Inside, she tries to get on with her day when in walks this absolute beast of a man. Not the character, he's a piece of sh but the actor Michael Smiley. He's always fantastic and you'll be seeing him on the channel again very soon when I cover Kill List. He's also great in Spaced and Luther. I'm gonna cast him one day. He heads into Fraser's office and the pair chat when Enid goes to get a tea, unfortunately overhearing Sanderson calling her Little Miss Perfect. She makes her presence known and after a frosty hello from Nathan, she gets an attempt at reassurance from one of her other colleagues. You know what I mean? We all make mistakes. Now on her own, it once again looks like we're going to get a flashback when Enid is able to push those thoughts down and head back to work. That's when she's approached by the mysterious man horror movie producer Doug Smart. After giving Enid a job offer she flatly refuses, he then suggests she be the one to assess his latest submission from director Frederick North. Fraser says it's already on her to-do list and leads him away as we cut to Enid and her colleague Perkins settling down to watch Fred's newest movie Don't Go In The Church. The film starts with a silent credit sequence which Perkins notes before or cutting to a couple of girls walking in the woods. The younger one isn't having a good time and suggests they go back, but her friend convinces her to press on, promising it'll be fun. She then suggests they play a game and whispers in her ear when we see they're in front of a cabin. The girl spins three times as we see Enid already feeling uncharacteristically uncomfortable. The older girl then orders her inside the cabin and we watch as she slowly creeps up the steps to the door and disappears inside. Enid drops her pen as the girl on screen picks up an axe and follows the younger girl inside. She's going in there to axe her a question. Question. And that question is, how many times can I hit you in the face with this until it stops being funny? And here's another shot that I love. I'm assuming it's two different actors and they've arranged their arms to suggest dismemberment and I think that's super clever. The girl steps into the doorway for a hero shot that I just love as Enid continues to quietly have a meltdown. She then sees this handsome mother when the film ends. <coughs> hey, hey, come on, I'm trying to grow and evolve here. That means no vomit gore. It was fun while it lasted. Enid leaves the bathroom and Perkins checks to make sure she's okay, saying the film shook him as well. So, wait, was that the whole movie? And if you're thinking, obviously not, John Joe, they're picking the part of the fictional movie that is most relevant to the plot at the time. What would you prefer? Every time Enid starts a movie, we have to sit down as an audience and watch it in its entirety. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love that. That'd be like the longest anthology movie in the world. I might do that. She says she's feeling under the weather and Perkins says he's always there if she needs to talk, citing the loss of his mother as a particular time that talking to others really helped. Enid blurts out a question asking why he thinks the amnesiac killer, the one whose murderous actions she is being blamed for, can't remember his crimes. Perkins doesn't have any real ideas but draws on his past to suggest a theory. It makes me think of my psychotherapy days would talk about how people construct stories to cope. You'd be surprised what the human brain can edit out when it can't handle the truth. He then invites her out for a drink, but Enid ignores this, instead apologising for his loss and thanking him for bringing her her notes before walking off. Cut to the tunnel as Enid hears the sound of a girl crying who she calls out to.
And I think this moment is pretty significant in regard to Enid's current mental state. She's literally following the sound of her sister's tears down a dark path. Then we get a cheeky shot of Enid's journal which reads, I don't care what you say, I saw Nina again. I wasn't imagining it. Not the first time, not the second time, and definitely not this time. It goes on, but those are the only clear bits that I could read. Is this Enid writing to her parents, to the world? Who is this testimony directed toward? Her mother asks if she's okay as she hasn't been able to get a hold of her and Enid apologizes saying work's been busy. She looks at the death certificate then decides to tell her mother about don't go in the church. I examined this film today. Nothing. Oh, okay. Listen, Enid, if you want this to be a conversation, you're gonna need to do a little bit more work, mate. Yeah? Mum tries to reassure Enid about her current situation, reminding her it's only a job when we cut to her falling asleep with her journal open, these pages directly addressed to Nina. Cut to static fizzing on the TV when we cut to Enid. She creeps down the stairs towards the set when the static clears, revealing the woods and then a young Enid calling out for Nina in front of the cabin. She turns to see the beast man stomping through the marsh, then finds a note wrapped in her sister's hair in her hand. Young Enid opens it up and sees written on it, don't go in the church, Frederick North. The girl looks up and out at the TV at us when Enid hears a moaning from the other room. <laughs> Waking up every morning as the child of a single mother with a drinking problem. Am I right, lads? Hey? Cut to Enid and Perkins screening a cartoon. Huh. Interesting. I never thought about the censors going after anyone else other than horror, so seeing them reviewing cartoons makes me think this was genuinely the best job you could have had in the 80s. Enid opens her pad and on the first page is the same exact text we saw in her dream. This isn't the first instance of Enid seeing something before it manifests in the real world. They're not trying to suggest she's psychic, are they? Most likely these are things she's already seen that are now worming their way into her delusions. Cut to Enid going in to see Valerie. Valerie played by the always wonderful Felicity Montague, who you might recognise as Lynn from Alan Partridge. She seems to be in charge of the archives, so Enid thinks she might be able to get more information on Frederick from her. Enid asks Valerie if she has any more information on Frederick North, but is told without a list of his films, digging up anything will take at least a week. Disappointed, Enid heads back to her desk, gathering her things as the others take notice. Cut to Enid seeing a poster of the Beastman from her dreams when she enters a video store. Inside, she looks at this VHS, the cover art of which is worth remembering. Another customer enters and returns a movie they describe as proper gory. Enid overhears, then after a moment makes her way to the clerk. There she tries to ask the clerk about Frederick North movies, but he isn't very forthcoming. All right, come on, all right, I've seen, I've seen that you've got Calumon Carnage, and I know that that's been banned. Bloody hell. Finally, the man is able to produce a copy of Asunder, but warns it's battered and someone taped over the ending with another movie. Which again is worth remembering. I tell you what, this movie really holds up on multiple viewings. Cut to Enid at home as she starts the tape. What we seem to have here is an honest to goodness possession movie when suddenly Enid thinks she recognises the lead actress. She rewinds the tape and takes a closer look, repeating the woman's lines again before pausing on her face. She then picks up the case and checks the name, seeing her credited as Alice Lee. She finally fast forwards the movie to a much more entertaining moment. Oh, for f**k's sake, Enid, what are you doing? These movies are wasted on you, I swear. Cut to Enid driving and enter tea with the folks. She announces she's here to talk about something, something to do with Nina. There's this actress. Her name's Alice Lee. I know it sounds mad, but I've got this... I've got this really strong feeling that I think it's her. That's not so ridiculous. I'm convinced Robert Sheehan is my twin brother and we were separated at birth. Same birthday, both Irish, and I mean, look at the resemblance. Spit an image if you ask me. Unfortunately, Enid's parents take this just about as well as Robert did when I turned up at his house that one time and shut her down. This is exactly why we did what we did. We try to do our best for you, but you go off doing whatever you want. What's also interesting is something the father lets slip while chastising her for never listening to them. Just like the day you went off with her. George. But we'll talk about that later. 
Cut to Enid's fizzy telly when we find her passed out on the sofa. We then get this cool as f in camera transition to the woods. Here we meet young Enid outside the cabin. Nina appears in front of her and smiles when the beast man steps into the doorway behind her. She then turns and goes to join him as young Enid calls out to her sister and yells no. Young Enid gets to the door and steps into the blue light when we join present day Enid first in the tunnels then in the archives looking for Don't Go in the Church. She finds the film canister and notes down the details when she's back on the move, the red light of the archives somehow still following her. Which is another in a sea of nice little touches that I just love about this movie. Eventually, Enid finds herself at this house, which just so happens to belong to producer Doug Smart. Doug. After an awkward hello, he lets her in, where Enid recognises the room as the same one from the movie earlier. Someone's got a keen eye. Doug then gives her a drink and shows her the award he got for that movie. That's when Enid sees a picture of Alice Lee on Doug's table and asks him if he thinks they both look alike. He sees the resemblance when Enid then asks what Frederick is like. What can I say? He's a provocateur. And a genius. Enid backs her drink and Doug gives her the details on Fred's next movie and where they're filming it. She also confirms that Alice is in this one with Doug advising this will be her last film as she's reached the end of her shelf life. Enid demands to know what's going to happen to her when Doug gets an altogether more handsy idea. She tries to push him away, but Doug doesn't take no for an answer, leading to this. <laughs> and in the interest of growing, I won't be making the deep throat joke you're expecting. I am thinking it though. Is that the secret to being an adult? Not saying exactly what you're thinking and feeling to whoever you want, whenever you want. Boring. Anyway, Enid gets the f out of there and we cut to her fresh out the shower, not doing so great. The phone rings and for some mad reason, Enid actually answers getting another typical phone call from the YouTube team in charge of the community guidelines. You f***ing sick I hope you get what's coming to you. You deserve to get sliced up your we get another cool as f transition as Enid arrives at work and stumbles on Anne and Sanderson viewing another Beastman movie starring Alice Lee. We are in a viewing here. She then heads to the archives and bypasses Valerie's bullshit to get the info she needs herself. After grabbing the address and telling Valerie everything is under control, she leaves and we get some very interesting information. The amnesia killer stated in court that he had never seen the film Deranged, which is supposed to have influenced the what? attack. So he didn't even watch it? That's what it says here. That's interesting, eh? Again, feeding into the ambiguity and lack of answers in any given situation in the film, but also reminiscent of a case that happened in the UK. I won't go into details, but the perpetrator was said to have watched Chucky 3, and then later it was found out they never had access to it. Enid pushes past the press and moves into the tunnel when we cut to this TV and are transported through its screen and into the woods as Enid drives. And I just want to say here, there's a thing the filmmakers do over the next 13 minutes or so that I just love. Unfortunately, the editing in this video is going to ruin the effect, but they change the aspect ratio slowly from 16.9 to 4.3, matching the VHS of the time period. The thing is, it happens so gradually you won't notice until it's over halfway done. At least I didn't anyway. Kind of like the creeping doom of pants insanity. Good stuff. Enid pulls up at this trailer and starts to walk toward it when she hears screaming coming from deep in the woods. She then turns back to the trailer and is met by the makeup artist who gets her inside mistaking her for another actor. The woman pops a dress on Enid and gets her to sit down when she notices this quite concerning front page headline. A production assistant then appears and says she's needed on set also mentioning the producer is yet to show up. So weird. <laughs> Doug never misses a gory murder scene. Well, I mean, technically he didn't. So, you know, give the guy a break. Now outside, Enid asks what they're going to do to Alice confusing the makeup artist. She then takes a continuity pick and we cut to Enid walking through the woods, mirroring the same journey the girl from the opening clip took, albeit with a much more subtle lighting situation. This trek is cut short when out of the shadows appears the man himself, Frederick North. I've been waiting for you. Fred. Frederick North. Step into the light. 
so I can see you. Well, vocally anyway. In the script for this video, it literally says find a better way to say this, but I'm not going to. You get what I mean. Enid first asks about Alice Lee, then don't go in the church, trying to find out where he got the idea from. Horror is already out there. In all of us. It's in you. Enid denies any horror is in her, and when Fred says he needs her to access her darker impulses, she lies to herself and says she doesn't have any. He tells her to improvise, to take control of her story, but again she refuses. Fred then tells her to f*** off when Enid begs him to see her sister. This of course being a genuine plea, but to Fred it's just another fantastic performance he's managed to get out of one of the more difficult actors. Finally happy, he tells her to enter her story as Enid is swallowed up by the camera light and then emerges in front of the cabin. She picks up an axe and makes her way inside side where she's given a big old lovely hug from the beast man. He tells her he's been waiting for her for such a long time and that she's always been in his heart. And look at the size of that fella, good lord. I bet she feels so safe in his arms. He lets her go as Enid plucks the courage up to end the monster for good. She turns and grabs the axe when the beast man reveals a screaming Alice. Beast man tells her to stop fighting it, that she is evil when Enid makes a rewrite. Oh, this is not in the script. No, no, no. then steps forward and sees a f***ing face in the beast man's chest wound which pisses her off even more. Cut! What the f*** is going on? If there's one thing Enid hates more than people kidnapping her sister, it's talking chest wounds. You never know what's going to trigger some people. The director finally yells cut and we smash back to the real world to face the reality of Enid's actions. Blood everywhere, the crew vomiting and Alice Lee screaming for help. Alice quite rightly bolts as Fred stays to see just what the bloody hell is going on here. You did this! This is all your fault! Maybe you should have gone with Alice, mate. That probably would have been a good shout. Cut to Alice running through the woods with Enid in hot pursuit. She catches up with her and tries to explain, but Alice is having none of it, saying she killed her friend Charles, Mr. Beastman. Enid tells her that she's her sister, but the girl hits her with the painful truth and runs away. Did you have a sister? And it's not you! No! No, please, no, you... No, you have to be here, please! No, please, please be her, please! Please be her, please. Enid collapses on the ground, begging this girl to please be her when she finds this contraption in her hand, which she uses to make everything just a little bit nicer. <sighs> Nina returns over the moon to be reunited with her sister, and the pair go running off in the woods together. Cut to the pair driving as on the radio it's reported that with all the video nasties eradicated, the crime rate has dropped to zero and it's just like they said it would be. The unemployment rate is at a record high. The criminals are all locked up. <laughs> There's nothing to be afraid of. They then arrive at home and are greeted by mum and dad with the setting looking familiar for some reason. I can't really place it. Nina runs over to greet her parents and everyone smiles, the happiest they've ever been as these weird images start to bleed through. Images that can't be the real world because this is the real world and everything is fine. Everything is fine, just like they said it would be. Now that the horror is gone. Enid then turns and reassures us with a simple smile that everything is going to be okay. <laughs> Well, what an astonishingly good movie. I am both in awe of it, but also now terrified I'll never be able to reach the same level of greatness. So yeah, thanks for that. While not being the extreme slaughter fest you've come to expect from me, Sensor is a film that I could not help but love top to bottom. Not content with just giving us an interesting and original story, Sensor is bursting with creativity in every department and for the up and coming horror filmmaker, truly inspirational. The story is simple enough, following a Sensor with a dark past as she slowly loses grip on her sanity. As I said in the intro, I think this is such a great concept, transforming the authority into the victim and eventual antagonist. She's also easy to sympathise with given her madness 
seems to be born out of grief for her lost sister, if that is she had nothing to do with that event. Enid's role in Nina's disappearance is never truly explained, but on the surface it seems they went out into the woods against their parents' wishes and she just vanished. While that's an easy pill to swallow, the ambiguity that washes across the film leads me to believe that nothing is certain. This uncertainty also bleeds into the love that Enid's parents feel for her. A small part of them does blame her, making their relationship emotionally complex. This is in direct opposition to Enid's life, which is one of binary choices. Yes and no, right and wrong, acceptable or not. She has built her life to have zero complexity as she seeks hard answers to her questions, but unfortunately not everything is so black and white. It's the same for the horror movies and the amnesiac killer. The horror movies are to blame without considering the ambiguity surrounding the man himself who can't remember the crime. No one even knows why he can't remember the crime. Questions piling on top of questions places a main character who craves confirmation of fact in an environment whose foundation is the unknown. No wonder she goes f mental. In terms of the cast, this is Neve Algar's show and she is so good in the role. She plays Enid with a quiet sadness that is at first sympathetic, but as the film goes on, devolves into something more threatening. I think it's also how controlled she is in the early parts of the film that make her lack of control or loosening grip on reality later all the more anxiety inducing. I also saw Prano say that Enid essentially senses herself in the film, being a woman of few but deliberate words, and Neve plays this to perfection. The subtleties in her performance make you feel what she's going through as she slips deeper and deeper deeper into darkness and it's pretty f great. Onto the gore and there's not very much to say on this one. I do like that when the gore does eventually hit, the effects are reminiscent of the horror films of that time period. I also wonder if the decapitation of Frederick North is a direct reference to Friday the 13th, with the hand popping up into frame the way it does, very similar to Mrs. Voorhees. Spoilers. Either way, I had resigned myself to the fact that I wasn't going to get any of the red stuff, so when it did land, I was pleasantly surprised. Oh, and don't even bother asking me about the beast man's chest mouth. Good lord. Prano, in the unlikely event that you're watching, could you please comment below and let me know just what the f*** was going on there. Onto the presentation, and for me, this is where the film really shines. There are so many creative editing choices and scene transitions throughout, with the filmmakers never wasting a single moment to flex their skills. Then we have the framing, lighting, colour palette, not to mention multiple multiple setups and payoffs like the VHS of the family and that ending shot. All of it is just wonderful and makes repeat viewings just as interesting as the first time you sat down for it. I also love the editing of the conclusion with the glimpses of the horrible truth lying underneath the happy ending Enid sees. It relates back to what Perkins said about people changing things in their mind when they can't cope with the reality. They put this on screen visually by making it look like Enid is essentially taped over her ending with something a little bit more family friendly. Again, another callback to earlier in the film with Asunder. In the end, and Sensor is an excellent film that captures the mood of the time while also providing us with a totally original twist on the person goes mad by the end plot. Every aspect of the film is done to perfection with my only small gripe being that I could have done with at least one more gory murder. But that's just me. It's a fantastic accomplishment by everyone involved and I cannot recommend it enough. So that was my review for Sensor. What do you lot think? For me, this is a masterclass in indie horror, a truly wonderful accomplishment, and I cannot wait to see what the filmmaker does next. I was worried we weren't going to see any good gore, but that ending certainly satisfied my urges. Speaking of which, if you want to see the Beast Man's talking chest wound completely uncut and early, head over to patreon.com forward slash John Joe Lyons. There you can find the uncut version of this review, plus others with more stuff being added all the time. There we got the uncut reviews, Patreon exclusive reviews, slash comic breakdowns, and the Discord. And all that can be yours for as little as $2 a month. You can pledge more, I really appreciate it, but instead maybe save that money for when the crowdfund starts next month. I'm going to be raising a budget for my short film Better Anything to help pay for everything that goes into it, which is a surprising amount. We'll have more information about that in the pitch video that will be posted to this channel, but until then, just set up a little side piggy bank for me, yeah? And as always, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to get your hands on this sick, filthy John Joe t-shirt, check out La Shirt on the Left. La Shirt on the Left are a horror clothing company specialising in some of the sickest designs based on all your favourite horror movies. They're also top blokes, so just do me a favour, yeah? Go over to the store and buy them out. Not even my shirt, just buy everything. And if you use the promo code JOHNJO, you get 10% off your order. That's promo code JOHNJO for 10% off at La Shirt on the Left. So that's it for another week. Like the video, leave a comment and click subscribe if you haven't already. My name's JOHNJO Lyons and remember, Better Anything crowdfund starts in April. See you there.